thank you, Renew, for the kind introduction, and thank you for your time to kind of conserve time so by going, going quickly. Um, I'm here to talk to you about resolving the peptide drug challenges through pre and the process you just heard about. But before I begin, I'd like to give the following disclaimer. Everything you hear about in this presentation are totally the view of mine, should not be construed as those represent the, the agency's view or policies. So I understand that during your product development is a challenging process, and you may have encountered the following, should I say, negative side effects. Perhaps you were confused as to if you're thinking, can we propose an alternative formulation? Would that be acceptable? You may have had headaches and say, oh my goodness, the product specific guidance that's called for in this have this technical difficulty we cannot resolve. Can we get some help? Or you are just fatigued and say, oh, this is too much. I think there's a better way of doing this. Can we do an alternative study? Or simply just throw your hands in the air and say, this is it. I'm abandoning this project. This is too difficult. Well, before you give up, did you know that you can actually ask the agency for help? And that is, that is why I'm here to tell you about by showing you a few case studies of how the companies in the past have asked us to address these issues. Because Talk, my case ideas are usually focused on, mostly focused on peptide drug products. So I give a little bit of regulatory overview of the peptide drug product. Then I'll talk about the um, guidance that we recently published on a generic synthetic peptide referencing the ROD, that is recombinant plus um, origin. Then I'll give three case studies on um, API characterization, alternative formulation, and immunogenicity assessment. The goal of the, my talk is really to show you how to utilize the pre and the process to address some of your challenges and obtain the agency's uh, comments and guidance. However, the lessons we learn from these case studies can also be applied to other products, other complex products as well. So the regulatory pathways for peptide drop product are such that the peptide regulatory definition for a peptide is pretty clean cut. It is less than 40, if it's less than 40, uh, 40 amino acids, consider peptides. And if it's a 40 synthetic peptide, it can be less than 100 amino acids. And peptides are regulated as drugs under the FDNC Act, which means any following on product will have to come through as a 505B2, which is the NDA process, or 505J as a generic. And for the purpose of this talk, we're only going to focus on 505J. And recently, we published the guidance for industry, and that's for certain highly purified synthetic peptides drug product uh, refer to the list drug drugs of our DNA origin. Now, these, this guidance applies to the following five uh, products only. Glucagon, liraglutide, neseratide, teraparatide, and tetaglutide. What these peptide drugs have in sim, um, shared in similarity are their length. These are higher, uh, they're longer peptides. They're more than 30 amino acids long. So these peptides are like the shorter peptides we in the past have greater challenge when we develop uh, these kind of sameness studies. That is why this guidance is there. And for the purpose of this talk, I'll refer to these, um, this guidance as the peptide guidance. Sameness consideration for generics. What does it mean by generics? Generics had to be therapeutically equivalent to a reference to this drug. I'll not delve too much into this because Dr. Uh, Cook already gave a very uh, good explanation to this. So I will not replicate her effort. So simply said, it is freely, generic should be freely substitutable to ROD and have the same effic, uh, clinical effect and safety profile. And also Dr. Cook mentioned the active in, uh, pharmaceutical ingredient sameness that is under the pharmaceutical equivalents. Um, when you're demonstrating the peptide active ingredient sameness, we need to consider, just like a small molecule, these basic principles, their physiochemical properties, and primary sequence, and they should have the same in the generic as it is in the ROD. But for these longer peptides, we also have other issues that we need to consider, such as secondary structure of the peptide, the ligamers and higher order structures, and aggregates. And also, if they have the biological activities, you need to also demonstrate that in vitro and in vivo, or in vivo. These five areas are already discussed in the guidance. Uh, I mentioned just previously. Another area that's uh, 
concerned to us are impurities in these longer peptides. These longer peptides generally have peptide-related impurities. And we know that peptide-related impurities usually come from two pathways. Degradation pathway, as a result of the API itself degrades over time during the process. And we think that because the API and the, uh, of the generic and the RLD are the same, they should have the same degradation pathway. But what concerns us are these process-related impurities. Now, if you remember, the peptide that we're talking about here are synthetic derived process, uh, peptides, and the RLDs are recombinant. So due to the differences in process, you may have differences in impurities, such as deletions and insertions. So we're going to focus on that, and I will discuss this later. Then there are wholesale-related impurities in other peptide products. However, for these synthetic peptides, it is not a concern for us because they don't exist. They shouldn't. Then you have residual chemicals. Residual chemicals and heavy metal and all those other impurities should be following the FDA and ICH guidelines. So without further ado, let's jump to the case study number one, which is API characterization. Demonstrate API characterization, uh, API sameness through API characterization. A firm submits the following question through control, and most likely before we publish the recent guidance. So they're asking if they can demonstrate uh, API sameness for their puppet product by looking at the primary and secondary structures. Would that be sufficient? Any additional information they, that they need to provide? This is a simple question because, well, we published the guidance. The API sameness question, the primary and secondary structure are only a part of it. You sh they should also provide higher order structures, possible aggregates, and bioactivity studies to demonstrate that API sameness exists between their product and the RLD. And then we refer them to this guidance. So that's all well and good. So the firm went back and did some studies. And then they came back with a reading request. Because what they found was, during the study of the NMR study, they found that one of the excipients in their formulation is giving them problems. And they couldn't get around this. So what they propose are two ways. One, they're going to extract out the peptide from the ROD and compare that to their drug substance. And then they're, they're proposing alternative methods, such as CDs, such as exclusion, or ionability, uh, as a combination to study the higher order structures and other aggregates. And not only that, in their meeting requ uh, request, they provide a method details, preliminary data, and this the data showing that the methods they propose have discriminating power, meaning that any changes in the um, structures can be picked up by these alternative methods. So for the purpose and scope of this talk, I will not go into why, uh, how we responded to this in detail. However, needless to say, the meeting should be granted because it's a very complete meeting request. It has all the necessary components for us to evaluate your proposed plans. And during the process, if we have additional information, we may contact the firm for a uh, three information request. Now, please keep in mind, the amount of information that you provide dictates how much we can tell you or how much recommendation and, and, and suggestion we can give you. So the lesson from this is, please do your due diligence, do your homework, and provide all the necessary data and make it complete package because in doing so it will give us something concrete to talk about during the meeting. So let's move on to case study number two, which is alternative formulation. As you know, many of the peptide products are in parenterals. They are injectables. By definition or by CFR, they should be Q1, Q2 same. However, there's an exception which Dr. Cook also alluded to. Under 21 CFR 314.94, there are three components can be different allowed under CFR, preservatives, buffers, and antioxidants. However, it is up to the applicant to identify and characterize the differences and to demonstrate how these differences will not affect the safety or efficacy of the drug product. So a firm decides to submit a question about their proposing an alternative buffer, which is allowed in the CFR, probably for reasons that you know, go around the patent or whatnot. And they believe that alternative buffer will not affect the physiochemical property of the drug product. So they're asking, is the alternative buffer acceptable? 
Well, if that question comes in as a control, we will tell them yes. It will be accepted for review or uh, for filing under the CFR. However, besides the physical chemical property that you're looking at, you should also consider because this is a peptide product where formulation has a strong effect on its higher order structures, you should also look at higher order structure, aggregation, bioactivity, and stability. And if any differences you observe, you need to justify that. The difference, how that would the difference will not affect the efficacy and safety. So this is, response is very general. As you can tell, the question itself is general too. But the lessons here is that if you're not sure about to what extent you should look at or to provide or uh, to demonstrate these differences that you have, uh, for formulation you're proposing, you should drop us a line because there could be other things that you may not think of. And for peptide products, formulations are very, very important for its higher order structures. And that is why we want to emphasize on that. And to demonstrate efficacy and safety, that's another set of studies that you have to provide. So if a firm just submits uh, alternative formulation for a peptide product such as this, um, and during the review, they may get this kind of um, efficiency back, and that is a lot of study that you have to do to respond. So we would rather see you do the do the, uh, do all these studies before you submit the application than that is during the review cycle. So the last case that I'm going to talk about, which is um, impurity assessment, which is pertaining to these five products in the guidance. For peptide-related impurity that's mentioned in this guidance, there are two ways to look at it. The common, when you find a specific impurity in your proposed product that is commonly found in the RLD, which we think might be a degradation product, the level of proposed generic should not be more than the RLD. And if you find any new impurities in your product, and that is not in the proposed uh, in the RLD, then 0.5% is the limit. That is, if you go above the 0.5%, you may have challenges, and you may need to demonstrate that through um, additional study that may be more appropriate for non-505J pathway, so maybe a 505B pathway. If it's within the 0.1 and 0.5% of the level in the, for these impurities, you will need to provide identification characterization and justify how these impurities will not affect the safety and efficacy. What this, so this is all outlined in the guidance, and you can read up yourself. But what this means is first, to identify the common and new impurities, you need to look at the ROD impurity profile. That's the first step. Then if you find anything new, to demonstrate safety and efficacy, you need to look at the immunogenicity risk assessment. And immunogenicity risk assessment is also discussed in, in this guidance. The risk of immunogenicity that's discussed in this guidance have two pathways. They're both T cell modulated and innate, innate immune responses. So this, both of these pathways need to look at, uh, to be examined for any new impurity found. That's between 0.1 and 0.5%. The T cell activated pathway can be demonstrated through MHC binding. And this can be done by in silico and in vitro assays. And innate immune activity can also be demonstrated by in vitro and animal studies. So the question we get from the firm is, they did um, the impurity profile using LCUV. Um, and what they found is they didn't see anything different. So they said, well, we don't see any differences in impurity profile. Does that mean we don't need to do any kind of immunogenicity assessment? So the problem here to us is really that the LCUV method is not sufficient when looking at this impurity profile for these longer peptide products. The reason why is, as we demonstrated in this um, published uh, publication, that the, the impurities from these drug products can co with the API. And LCUV may not be sensitive enough to pick them up because they will be underneath the broad API piece. So what we recommend for them is to go back and look at it using another method, perhaps a UPLTMS method, that's more sensitive and more selective for these impurities. So after the method development, uh, the applicant went back and they come back with a meeting request and 
say, well, looks like we did identify a new impurity, and that's up around 0.3%. So what they did was they in, conducted in silico MHC binding prediction, and they find that the propensity, propensity for binding for this impurity is no greater than the API itself. So they asked us to comment. First, is the in silico MHC binding assessment sufficient? Second, if both in silico and in vitro MHC binding assessment show no increase in immunogenicity, do they still need to investigate the innate immune responses? Well, the first question, uh, as some of the speakers in the previous session alluded to, is quite, it's something that is more of a re review issue. We cannot really tell you if uh, uh, a set, the study that you've done is acceptable for uh, for your application, but what we can tell you is you need to provide validation for many of these, and you need to provide the data. Please su submit them into your application, and we will do this in review. Now, if you have anything s specific about this assay or this uh, your result, you can also submit more specific questions, and we may be able to address those. And do they need to identify um, innate immune activities if they don't see anything T cell? Yes, they do. So this is also outlined in the guidance. So they need to do both pathways. So final thought. We understand that developing complex generics is a stressful and challenging time. And but when you have doubts, please reach out to us uh, through the pre process that is you know, that's introduced in the previous session. But whatever you do, please come and be prepared and do the necessary R&D. Because what we like to see is a complete package. Because that will give us opportunity to provide you with more concrete feedback. You need to provide rationale. You need to provide experimental design. And data, data. Data is good. We love data because that gave us a basis to talk. Because with anything without beta, data is really hypothetical. And for hypothetical questions, we can answer them in a very general sense. But ultimately, we are here to help you, to help you address some of these issues early on in the process. The goal is to speed up the review, shorten the review cycle, like the previous speakers have mentioned. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and also acknowledge my team over at ORS. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ping. We next have Dr. Dei Zeng. He is a